You are our only king forever, Lord. You are the king of our heart. You are our vision. You are our best thought, Lord. The highest, highest possible ideals that we can think of or strive for fall woefully short of your greatness and your glory. We humble ourselves, Lord. And a little bit later, we're going to be taking and putting our eyes on the bread and the cup. Our tremendous, tremendous, victorious Savior who went to the cross for us. We humble ourselves before you, Lord. Lord, we, we are here, your church, in your presence, and we just pour out our thoughts, we pour out our prayers, we pour out our needs, our shortcomings, our fears, our worries, our joys, our hopes, and our dreams. We give you thanks. You hear us.
give you thanks. You are our vision, our greatest thought, our living and true Messiah. We give you thanks, God. What a creator, what a savior we have. Amen. Have a seat this morning. Well, good morning. Welcome to Centerpoint Community Church. We're thrilled to have you. Welcome to 2019. I hope the year's been had a great start for you and your family. If you're a guest here, I want to extend a, a special welcome to you. Thank you for trying a new place in a brand new year. We're thrilled to have you. We'd love to ask you the honor, if you would allow me to, of, of filling out the contact card for us today. You'll find this in the back of the seat right in front of you. Let us know who you are, uh, how you heard about us, or what brought you in. We'd love to connect with you and get to know you better. You can drop this in the offering plate that's going to be coming right past you here at the end of my announcement time. And remind everybody to use the other side of the card. Let us know how we can pray for you on the response side. Our staff prays for you every single week over these cards, and we'd love to receive that from you today in the offering plate as well. As far as our announcements today, I've got a few for you. And now that we're back into uh, somewhat of a normal rhythm, I hope it's starting well for you. I want to encourage you to be reading your bulletin regularly each and every Sunday. A lot of our gatherings and Bible studies are back into full swing now that it's the month of January. Keep informed and on top of that, the bulletin is the best place to get that information on a week-to-week -week basis. Uh, speaking of, this morning, there was a brand new Bible study gathering that started today. It is an 845 gathering up in our fellowship hall. It's entitled Vanishing Grace. Now, this is a, there's plenty of space in fellowship hall for you to join in this Bible study. Pick that room on purpose. Nice, big, open, easy to find. We'd love to have you there. It's free to attend. There is no requirement of signing up. It's nice to know. Uh, Pastor Paul, how much are the books if they want a study book? $8 for the study book. What a deal. Love it. Uh, so if you want one of those books to kind of enhance and give a little more depth to that study, you can get those there with those leaders. That started this Sunday morning. It'll be going on for the next few weeks. We want to invite you to attend the study Vanishing Grace. Now, this week at Thursday, at Thursday? On Thursday at 9 a.m. is our Grief Share Seminar. It's a one-day gathering focusing on processing through the loss of a spouse. Now, if you're interested in coming, you've been thinking about it, not too sure, you can still sign up today. It's fully free to attend. Signing up just helps prepare and plan for your arrival and your participation. You can go out to the community center to do that. Jeff, give me a nice little wave. Jeff is showing you right where the community center is, right out those doors. And after that, uh, that gathering on Thursday, it really launches into the normal 13-week journey of grief share. So you'll learn more about that there on Thursday, or you can talk with Vanessa or Sharon there after the service at the community center. That's all I have for you this morning. Nothing too crazy or complicated. Our, our final announcement is this, and I'll have our ushers come forward for, for the offering this morning. It's for our 6th through 12th grade students. And I know you're really excited for your student to go back to school, right? I'm excited for my kids to go back to school. They're not in sixth grade yet. Uh, as we round up our winter break, we're going to be turning our, uh, our lobby kind of into a video game center. Uh, students, you got that message in the system. If you brought your console this morning for setup and, and just work for that, find me after service. I'll take that from you, put it in a secure location. We'll have everything ready to roll at 6 p.m. for all of our 6th through 12th grade students. So at this time, we're going to bring our ushers forward for the morning, collect our offering, uh, if you are a guest, this is not our grab to try and get money from you. This is one of those rhythms and routines, one of the many ways that we worship God. These funds will go right back into the church here, our, our local efforts, our global outreach initiatives. You can see more about those at our missions display in the lobby. 
Uh, but we're going to pray for today's offering. Uh, you can use the envelope, whether it's uh, analog stuff with checks and cash, or there's even digital instructions on the envelope as well. Will you join me to pray for the offering? We'll continue in worship today. Dear God, we want to thank you, first of all, for a new year a new opportunity to see you work in our lives, to work through our, our congregation and, and, and furthering the message of your gospel for your mercy and strength that are new every single day and as well as your blessings that you give us every, every single day. I pray that you take this offering, these gifts, further the work of your kingdom, lift high the name of your son, and empower the saints to do your ministry, and we'll praise you for the success that we see through these gifts of offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Sure. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for opportunities to gather, for our freedoms that allow us to be here. Lord, we thank you as well for the kind and gentle ways that you've dealt with us this past year. And oh, how we look forward to what you have for us in the year to come. We love you. Thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Happy New Year. Isn't it great to put that old year aside and look forward to what God has for us in this new year? You know, the new year is traditionally a time of of high resolves and good intentions, right? Today, this is more imperative than ever. If there ever was a time to to scrub the slates of our lives, to make amends for our mistakes, to confess and ask forgiveness for our sins, it is now, my friends, it is essential for us to begin everything, including this new year, with our God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I'm sure I am not alone when I say this. There are some regrets that I have in things I've said, things I've thought, and things I've done this past year. How about you? Someone defined the whole feeling of regret as as being sorry mentally for a misdeed or a mistake, but never choosing to do anything about it. King Saul in the Old Testament is a prime example. He regretted his wrongdoings, but he failed to right the wrongs, to change anything. A related feeling is the feeling of remorse, where someone is is sorry both mentally and emotionally and that's usually because they've been caught doing something and they fear the pain or the consequences that are coming their way judas the disciple who betrayed jesus is a good example of someone who felt great remorse but he couldn't see how god could forgive him the third related feeling is one of repentance, where someone is sorry mentally, emotionally, and volitionally for their acts against man or against God. But it's not like the person who sent the IRS a check for $150 with a note that said, if I can't sleep, I'll send the rest. Wouldn't that be nice? Sorry, it doesn't work that way, does it? It is like the prodigal son in the New Testament who realized his sin and repented. He literally changed his mind. He changed his whole course of action, and he returned humbly to his father. Brothers and sisters, listen. The curtain of time has come down on another year. No amount of agonizing over what we should have done differently will rewrite the witness of your life and mine thus far. But God has brought us into the time of beginning again, and through his grace and through our repentance, we can resolve to become more like Christ in the year ahead. I hope that's your desire. It sure is mine. The Lord's Supper is a great place where we can begin again. You know, the Apostle Paul told the Christians in the city of Corinth some things concerning their preparations for the Lord's Supper. Here's what he said in 1 Corinthians 11. He said, let a person examine himself then, and then eat of the bread and drink 
of the cup. You know that word examine means to try to learn the genuineness of something, the sincerity of something by examination and testing. That word examine is, a, is akin to the words scrutiny or scrutinize, which means to inspect, to analyze, to study, or to search out. In Psalm 139, one of my favorite psalms, David prayed a prayer asking God to do this very thing, to search him. He says, search me, oh God. Is that something we do very often? Oh God, take a look. More often than not, it's, Lord, I, 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 I've got some things I want to share and that's it. David opens up his life. He says, search me, oh God, and know my heart. Try me. And know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In Psalm, David prayed this prayer. He asked God, God, to examine his heart, to reveal to him anything in his life that he needed to repent of, that he needed to make right. You know, as I thought about that, I began to wonder, could it be that David didn't trust his own evaluation of his life, that that he was concerned that he might miss something or avoid something? My friends, I wonder, do we show the same concern as we begin this new year, as we approach the Lord's Supper? Search me, God. Know my heart. See if there's anything in me that offends you. I think David wanted to be absolutely sure there was nothing in his life that would come between him and God. He knew from experience. We know the life of David. He knew from experience what it was like to be at odds with the Lord. And that was not a place that he ever wanted to return to again. My friends, once God shows us those, what he calls grievous ways, those thoughts, those words, those actions, those attitudes that grieve his heart, our response is not simply one of regret or remorse. It's one of repentance, turning away, making things right. Jesus said in Luke chapter 5, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. As one sinner to all of you sinners, I want to encourage you all to take the next few minutes to examine your life with the Holy Spirit's help and make sure that you are fit to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. If for some reason you can't settle things with the Lord today, please let the elements pass you by, lest you offend God by partaking of something that you're not worthy to do. And if you don't know the Lord, I would also encourage you to let those elements pass you by as well. Let's go before Him now. Let's pray. Search our heart, O oh God. See if there is anything grievous. Help us to make things right between you and us right now. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your patience. We thank you that you love us 
no matter what. And we take this time this morning to honor you, to commemorate your great sacrifice, Jesus, for us. Thank you for meeting us here. Amen. Amen. I want to invite the gentleman to come and join me here as we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper. You know, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he explained to the disciples, this is my body that is broken for you. Jeff, would you pray a a prayer of thanksgiving for the bread? Lord, we come before you and we thank you for... um, We thank you for the representation of of, uh, the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Lord, we think of the body that was broken for us and we thank you for uh, the love that was shown through that, that Mm. we might have life through that. Lord, just... um, What a picture that presents for us. And we thank you for that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can you imagine sitting across the table from Jesus and having him pick up a piece of bread and and, and explain to you that this bread is a symbol of what's going to happen to his body? As we partake of this bread, may that impact our minds to realize that Jesus allowed the world, not just soldiers, but the world to put him on the cross, but he did it for us, for our sins. He was broken. Do this in remembrance of me.
In the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup. Gary, will you offer a prayer of thanksgiving? Let's pray. Lord, um, we thank you this morning for the uh, remembrance of your sacrifice and, mm-hmm. and this precious scripture uh, as an invitation to search ourselves. And mm-hmm. uh, we see things uh, inside of time so that uh, this is a new year, but you remain the same whatever mm-hmm. year it is. And I pray that we would honor you in an appropriate way uh, daily. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Jesus said this cup is the new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you for putting this celebration into our lives to remind us new and afresh that you came for us. You knew our need. We were lost in our sins and destined for hell. Yet you, in your love, came under the Father's direction to come into our world and to save us from our sins, to save us from ourselves, to give us hope that extends beyond this life. Oh, how we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. You know, starting the new year by observing the Lord's Supper is a, is a great way to begin the new year because it begins by repenting and examining ourselves, something we should do on a regular basis, but it's a begin again kind of feeling. But there's, there's more I would like to share with you this morning in our time together. At this time of making New Year's resolutions, and I know most of us have been around long enough to go, oh my goodness, resolutions, yikes. I am not very good at those. Well, hopefully we can help in some way today. I want to challenge you 
to include in your resolutions to lose weight. Uh, I, I read somewhere somebody said they want, their resolution was that, they, that their friends would gain weight so they would feel skinnier. I, I don't know, that's not mine, but I, I can understand how it is. I, wanna, I want you to include what I'm calling the three R's of spiritual health and development uh, in your resolutions this year. When I was in school quite a while ago, we had the, the three R's of education. You know what they are, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, apparently spelling was not on the list of important things in those days, but that's okay. The three R's that I would like to present to you today, as I said before, are keys to our spiritual health and our spiritual development. I think they're found many places, but where we're looking this morning is in the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. If you have your Bible in some form, please join me there. It begins, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the the Lord gave, where, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility. Youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate, and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. It's 1605 B.C. Anybody remember quite that far back? Might seem like that sometimes. And there's a crisis in the Middle East. Is that really a big surprise? It's just an ongoing thing. It's been going on for, for centuries. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, modern-day Iraq, has invaded the southern kingdom of Judah, and he's besieged the capital, Jerusalem. The Babylonian army, apparently with God's help, quickly dispatches the Jewish defenses, leaving the city theirs for the taking. Folks, we can only imagine the fear and despair that gripped the people of Judah that day as everything they once knew was swept away. It's in this setting that we meet the principal characters of our story. Look at verse 6. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them new names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. I would have preferred Daniel. I don't know about you. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. Bless you. Were you saying Abednego or sneezing? I'm not sure which. Sounded a lot like the same. Now, we don't really know how many young men that were inducted or, or drafted into this school, but the passage tells us the qualities all of them were to possess, and even a little bit more about the four that are mentioned by name. The first quality we see in these young exiles relates to their position in the culture. It's this. First of all, they were of noble or royal descent. That means they had all the best advantages the Jewish culture could provide. Schooling, good health, good education all the way around. They were also young men, likely teenagers around the age of 14 or 15. That's when the Babylonian culture liked to put young men into special training. They were in good health without physical defects. They were good-looking. 
whatever that means. I don't know what that means. But in that culture, they were good looking. They were above average students. I would not have qualified to get on this bunch, but some of you probably would. That means they were quick learners who were wise and knowledgeable in secular and religious education. And they were also poised and competent to serve in the royal court, partially because of their upbringing. That means they already understood what was expected of those who were to serve at the king's bidding. Those who qualified were to be trained for three years to learn the language, and upon their graduation, they would enter into the king's service in his royal court. Now, the four boys from Judah met these criteria, but there was something more to them, something that set them apart. Look at verse 8. But Daniel, one of the four, resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Now, that tells me right off the bat, you can see that these young men were well grounded in their faith. Here's why. In the Jewish mind, the king's food was contaminated because the first portion of the food and the wine had been offered to pagan idols. Consuming either of them in their minds made them unclean and out of fellowship with God. So because of their convictions, Daniel and his friends asked to be exempted from the royal diet. This was great food. It may have been even better food than what they were used to, but because of how it came to them, they wanted nothing to do with it. Now, folks, they could have just refused to eat or drink But in asking permission, they showed yet another quality of the king's court, their respect for authority. Verse 9 tells us that God gave Daniel favor and compassion from the man in charge. Verse 17, later in our passage, tells us that God gave all four of these young men learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. Folks, that tells me they all were gifted by God. Now, when their time of training came to an end, the king himself interviewed the graduates. None could compare to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They now served the king of Babylon, but he was not the only king that they served, as we will see a little later in the story. These qualities, great qualities, held these four in good position throughout most of the time, But folks, if you know the rest of the story, you know there were a number of occasions that it would have been easier or safer to compromise and follow the crowd. It was during these times that the three R's that I mentioned a little while ago came to be utilized. What are the three R's? The first one is found back in verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. The the phrase there that I want to key in is Daniel resolved to do right. That's the first R. He resolved to do right. To resolve means to make a firm determination and to remain unwavering on that determination no matter what. To make a firm decision to remain steadfast no matter what. Folks, this level of commitment requires an act of our will, an intentional choice. Daniel and his three friends purpose in their hearts and their minds to do what God instructed and not compromise their convictions or their values no matter what came their way. 
this resolve (laughs) was soon to be tested. Which brings us to the second R. Daniel told the steward in charge of them, look at verse 13, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Now this is not a proof text for a vegetarian diet, by the way, okay? Some people make it sound that way, but it is not. Then he continues, then let our appearance and the appearance of everybody else who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. The second R that I see in play here is rely on God. These young men had such confidence that God was going to honor their commitment, they asked to be put to the test. They set this up themselves. But what I think they're really saying is this, put our God to the test, and he'll show you how faithful he is. And he was. After 10 days, Scripture says, they looked better and in appearance. I like this too. This is so real for the Scripture. They looked better in appearance and fatter in flesh, is what it says, than any of the rest who stayed on the king's royal diet. And so the steward allowed them to continue on their special diet. At the end of their training, the end of three years, all the trainees were brought before the king. Look at verses 19 through 20. And the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them a little better, 10 times better. Wow. Here we discover the third R. Receive the reward. They resolved, they relied, And now they've come to the place to receive the reward. Folks, God rewards those who are obedient and faithful to him. With God's help, these these young men, 18 years old, rose to a level 10 times above their peers. And the king was, of course, greatly pleased with them. These three R's continued to serve Daniel and his friends in the years to come. The very next year, Nebuchadnezzar had a reoccurring dream that troubled him so much he couldn't sleep. Now, you need to understand that the Babylonians believed that dreams were messages from the gods. So you can understand how critical it was that the king understand the meaning of this dream concerning the future of his kingdom. So he called everybody in, all his counselors, all the sorcerers, magicians, astrologers, anybody who had any level of wisdom to come, and he asked them to do two things. One, to interpret the dream, but the second thing was the most challenging. He also wanted them to tell him what his dream was. He did so to prove or to validate their true powers. Well, if you know the story... Oh, I I forgot. Back up. He also added, if they couldn't do it, he would have them cut into pieces and have their houses plowed under. A little pressure there, right? But if they could, they would receive great honor and lavish rewards. Well, as you read the scriptures, none of them even tried. In fact, they told the king, no one could do this except the gods. And by the way, O king, the gods do not live among men. Pretty good excuse, right? Well, the king didn't buy it. He became furious, and you know the story. He gave orders that all of the wise men in the land be executed, which, by the way, included Daniel and his four friends, who knew nothing of the dream or the order of execution until the day when the executioner showed up. 
When they found out, Daniel risked going to the king directly and asking for what the king denied everyone else. Time. And the king miraculously consented. See, God went before Daniel. The king consented. Upon returning home, Daniel did what we probably would do. He went to his friends, and he explained what had happened. And then he asked them to do what? To pray. We need to pray. We need to pray for God's mercy here, but we also need a solution, an answer to the mystery that has come our way, that God has put us in a place to interpret, to understand. Folks, the three R process was in place again. These young men resolved to do right. No, it, w- it would have been easier maybe safer for them to contact or or pay someone to get them out of town on the next southbound camel, right? But these young men, they stuck it out. They relied on God for an answer. And guess what? He did. Apparently that same night, Daniel had a a vision or a dream that enabled him to, to do what was important. And as to the rewards, they were but a moment away. When Daniel came before the king, he was able to testify to the king that it was the God of heaven who gave him the interpretation of the dream, who gave him the dream itself and to testify to God's great power that it wasn't him. He also, at that moment of interpreting and telling the king what he wanted to hear, he was promoted to be governor of the entire province of Babylon. Then he was put in charge of all the wise men in the land as well. And finally, the king bestowed on him many lavish gifts. But Daniel was a man who loved God and knew what God would require. He did not forget his friends, his three great friends, and their important role of prayer support. At his request, the king made them administrators over the province as well. The pattern to resolve, to rely on God, and to receive the reward continues through the rest of the book of Daniel. The next fact, The next chapter finds Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refusing to bow down to this giant idol of gold that the king had commissioned built. The sentence for not bowing down was to be thrown into a blazing furnace. Now listen to the king's reply. Listen to the to Hananiah, Zachary. Let's try that again. Listen to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's reply to the king. Here it is. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Did you hear the resolve? Did you hear it? Did you you feel or understand the reliance on God? Those words stick out in my mind. But if not, O king, if things don't go the way that we are predicting, if not, we will still not serve you, but we will serve our God. You know the rest of the story. This did not make the king happy. It made him happy angry, so angry that he heated the furnace even hotter, so hot that when the guards who took these three young men to throw them in were killed by the intense heat. Yet Shad, Shaq, and Abed were unharmed. They walked around in this fiery furnace. Well, the king couldn't help but notice, so he shouted for them to come out, and they came out, and none of them was burned, singed, or even smelled smoky. Talk about having an influence for God. Listen to the king's response after witnessing this miracle. Right. 
Verse 28. Are we there? There it is. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Who's saying this? Is this a prophet? No, it's a pagan king, someone who had no clue of who God was. Yet in this very moment... He made it clear this God is the only God who can rescue like this. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province again. There's the reward. They received that reward. Folks, the the three R principle is not just found in the book of Daniel. Wherever you see people being used by God to accomplish great things in and out of Scripture, you'll see this principle displayed. It's not because it's basic, but because it's necessary. There's Noah and the ark. Joshua in the battle of Jericho, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, Ruth and Naomi, Queen Esther and Haman, the disciples, Stephen, Peter, Paul, William Tyndale, Martin Luther, D.L. Moody, Billy Graham, Bill Bright, Dar Merrill, Doug and Jackie Rickard, Jerry Wilkie, Greg Steer, and many, many more. All who resolved to do things God's way, who relied on him by faith that God's best was their best and who received rewards in this life that only God can give, miraculous victories over evil, true joy and peace, fulfillment in life, a reason to live, a cause to die for, people's lives transformed and a heaven reward and so much more. Folks, as we begin this new year, please realize that this year will be full of decisions, big and small. It'll be full of opportunities, good and bad. And it'll be full of occasions, happy and sad. As we encounter each one, I want to challenge you to remember these four young men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and follow their example. How they practiced the three R's whenever needed, sometimes daily. How they surrounded themselves with godly friends they could count on. How they stood up to the pressures in their society, in their world, whether it's in the job or the neighborhood, to not conform. They stood up to not conform or to give up. And how they stayed true to their convictions, no matter what. Satan is not done with us, folks. And our world is changing around us. We need these principles to help keep us on track. Resolve to obey. Rely on God and then receive his rewards as only he can give. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, that this whole new year presents another batch of opportunities decisions, occasions that will come our way. Enable us, Lord, to look beyond what the world presents to what you desire. Thank you for these faithful people, Lord. Bless them in these days ahead. Encourage their hearts and allow us to make a difference in this little community here, wherever we live, wherever we work, 
until Jesus returns. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. Bless you. Have a wonderful new year. I hope to see you next week. Take care. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When the solid ground is falling out.